hi everyone. So yes, I will talk about uh, free computer interfaces, but before that, I want to shortly recap the nervous system. So Rohit was already talking a bit about it. He mentioned that it's important for movement. So we have here the brain, we have the spinal cord, and we have the peripheral nerves that are connecting our brain to our muscles, and that's how we move. And movement is actually very important for us. There are even some scientists that say that brains exist because of movement. And when I say movement, I don't mean only moving from point A to point B. I also think of speaking, because we move our muscles to talk. I also mean of typing, because we move our fingers to write. I also think of some physical gestures that we do as a nonverbal communication. So it's very important for us. And sometimes, because of some reasons, there might be a problem in this system. And that's where being computer interfaces come into the game. They want to help these people that have some problems with their nervous system. So we live in an era uh, that is dominated by the, by the power of computers. And we want to use this power that the computers have. And that's why we have the brain, and we want to connect the brain and the computer. And that's how we have a computer interface. So, <laughs> uh, the reason that we, want, that we do this is that with brain computer interfaces, we want to replace, restore, or, or improve some of the output functions of the brain or of, of the central nervous system that consisted of the brain together with the spinal cord. So, there are some patients that might have some problem in this upper part of the spinal, spinal cord or in the lower part of the brain. And because of that, they cannot move their muscles. Actually, they can move only their eye muscles. And imagine that you cannot have any communication with anyone. The only thing you can do is to use your eyes to answer some simple yes, no questions. So with brain-computer interfaces, we want to help these people. We uh, want to read the signals from the brain, give them to a computer, and then the computer tells the message that the person wanted to say. So how is this possible? We can have some different designs of keyboards, like we see on this picture and on this picture. And then the patients that have the spring-computer interface have to imagine that they're moving the cursor on the computer. And that's how, with this movement of the cursor, they're going to type. And that's how we <coughs> understand what they want to say. And actually, they can type 10 characters per minute. For them, this is a very big thing. And for us, it might be very slow. Actually, it is very slow. Because an average person types four words per minute. So, I mean, compared to 10 characters, that's like one or two words. It, as I said, it's still a lot for them, but we want to help them. And actually, that's what I'm working on for my master thesis. So I want to understand the message that the person wants to give. Because when we are talking, we don't really think how are we going to type it. We just think of the message that we want to give to the people. And that's how we want to understand what a person wants to say and then use the computer to directly say the, that message. And that's how we replace the function of the organs that we use for speech. Then we also can restore some functions. And actually, there are some patients that might have some problem with their spinal cord. And everything with the brain is OK. Everything with the muscles is OK. So we just want to reconnect them, because the connection is the problem. So what we can do is we record the signals from the brain, and then we can use electrical stimulation to stimulate the muscles so they can move. And here we see a picture of one gentleman that has his muscles stimulated, and that's how he can do a movement with his hand. We can also improve some functions, and that, and that is with patients that had stroke, and because of that, they cannot move as well, like in the previous case. But now, luckily, they can rehabilitate. And we will use brain computer interfaces to help them rehabilitate faster. So just like in the previous case, we record from the brain, we stimulate the muscles. But with the difference now that we're also recording how much the muscle is moving. Let's say that I want to move my hand from here to here. But because of the stroke, I can just move it to here. And then with the electrical stimulation, I will finish the movement to here. And that's what happens here. And actually on this picture, we see this 
person that has his legs that are electrically stimulated. And so far, I talked only about the medical applications of brain-computer interfaces. But actually, everyone can use them. You, me, everyone could use them. Everyone could take advantage of them. So, Nissan is working on a new technology that's called Brain to Vehicle, where they use brain-computer interfaces to make the, um, the experience of driving a car even better. And so, when, the, so we, when we think that we want to turn the wheel, there is some time uh, until the signal from the brain comes to the muscle and then we do the movement. And they want to compensate for this delay. And they want to start moving the car even before I start moving my arms, my hands. And we can also supplement some function with brain-computer <laughs> interface. <laughs> okay, so as you already saw, uh, this drummer uses a third robotic arm to have a better performance. <laughs> and so far, I gave a lot of examples of what we can do with brain-computer interfaces, and I'm sure that you already wonder how can we actually measure the signals from the brain. Well, there are two uh, approaches. We can either have electrodes outside the head, or we can have a patient or the person have a surgery and have electrodes implanted inside the brain. So it would look something like this. But not everyone really wants to have surgery, and that's why non-invasive brain-computer interfaces are preferred, and even 80% of the brain-computer interfaces are based on these non-invasive techniques for measuring the signal. And this is actually so easy that you're going to see it yourself. So I'm inviting my friend Tanya to come to the stage. Whoa. <laughs> okay. So what she's going to do... Uh, okay, sorry. Before that, I wanted to tell you something else. I just wanted to make the comparison between non-invasive and invasive measurement of the signals. So let's take a look at these birds. And this is the original picture that we have. And then if we were to measure it with non-invasive techniques, we would, so imagine that these are the signals from the brain. I mean, they're not, but visually it's much better to represent it with a picture. So this is what we would see if we had non-invasive techniques. So we have, um, a lot of noise, and the resolution is very low. And we see some green, we see some red. I would say it's difficult to say what it we had before, but still, we can work on the picture a bit and get some useful information. And if we use invasive techniques, then we have these. So we see the words, there is still a noise, there is lower resolution, but the signal is much better. And just for comparison, you can see that this approach is much better than this. But yeah, we cannot have a live demo with invasive techniques. And that's what I want to know. So, Tanya will look at her screen and this thing that you're seeing now. So what we see here are these patterns that are blinking in different frequencies. And actually the signal that enters from her eyes goes to the back of her head. And there we can see in which frequency she's looking. And depending on where she looks, she will do something interesting. So we actually wait for the connection between the computer. And <laughs> yeah, actually there are a lot of people here. And here it is. So <laughs> depending on where she is looking at, right now she's looking at the right. And that's why the car started to move to the right. Now she's look to the right. Maybe you can look somewhere else. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, now she's looking to the front and that's why um, yeah, um, the camera is not connected to the screen. <laughs> so the people in the front row could see it. Now let's try that everyone else. <laughs> okay. 
Okay, you know, with live demos, you can never know what's going to happen. Okay, great. So the car moves to the front, to the right. Okay, that's the same turn. And if it goes to the left, I think it would be enough for this demo. <laughs> okay, maybe not. <laughs>
A very good question. I'm sure you've already heard for cochlear implants. So that's exactly what they're doing. The people cannot hear. And then we use electrical stimulation to give the signal, the information that's in the environment to the person. And yeah, cochlear implants are the next step. So it's also a very big research field on which a lot of people are working right now. And they predict that in a few years we will also have cochlear implants. So people will, blind people will be able to see. Thank you. I can also add here and refer you to our YouTube channel because we had a talk about cochlear implants. And a year ago in our birthday event we had a talk about sensory senses. And also Lily was presented there and she talked about different ways how currently blind people are getting some support using a, a, that, that technology to help them see. Okay, more questions. Yes, please, there in the middle. Please give the microphone to the lady. Thank you. Hi, thanks a lot for the presentation. It's really interesting. So my question is also just following the other lady's question. When you have the information in the brain, and you have the equipment, and then it goes to the computer, and you showed one like, example about one person lying in the bed. Is it possible for him to turn off the signals? I mean, otherwise, basically, you can read everything what he thinks in the brain right now, right? The question is, if we have a um, brain-computer interface that's bringing information from the brain to the computer, can the computer also read some extra information from the brain of this person? <laughs> okay, so... That's also a good question and that's also one very big research question. How to decide when I'm thinking something? Do I want to say it or do I don't want to say it? And yeah, people are working on that. So we still don't have the answer, but of course that, you know, data privacy is very important. So people care about it, don't worry. And there's a question. Yes. Uh, how strong is the signal you are receiving in the device? Can, we, can it be disturbed by the mobile phone, for example, when you uh, put it to your head to send some fake signals, for example? How strong is the, the signal that you, the brain is delivering to the computer and what can disturb the signal, for example, the mobile phone or some other techni technical things? So, to be honest, I don't know about the phone. I can just guess that it does affect it. I don't know how much. But depending on the technology that we use for recording, like I said, non-invasive and invasive. Using non-invasive, like we had on the demo, even if she just blinks, we see that in the recording. And actually, this signal is much bigger than the signal that we get from the cells from the brain. And this is the signal from muscles, right? When the person is blinking. Exactly, yeah. So, so the muscles of the skull, they can influence the rate of the EEG. Exactly. So we want movement, but in some cases, we don't. <laughs> More questions at the moment? Yes. With these uh, implants that are like used in the invasive method, do they have a lifespan, like the electrodes, and how often do they need to be changed? Or, uh, yeah. The question is, do the implants in the brain for so invasive technology has an expiration date? Well, like everything else in the world, it also has expiration date and it actually depends what the people want to do. Sometimes while they're doing surgery, they put electrodes in the brain, they do some measurements and then they take them out. So it happens, for example, with people that have epileptic seizures, maybe. They do some surgery because they need to do something else in the brain and they opened the skull, the skull anyhow and they want to take advantage of it for research and they might take the electrodes out <laughs> but in other cases they put the electrodes there and they stay in the brain till the rest of the life Thank you very much As earlier I encourage you to come back to Victoria after the talks we will have some more time after all the talks and now let's thank her for a great interesting talk <laughs>